we are at the final presentation for the conference and I'm excited to have Tim Sarong here uh, presenting containers are hideously undebuggable black boxes and we never should have invented them. So that's an intriguing title. So Tim is someone I'm sure you're all familiar with having presented at previous LCAs about high availability and distributed storage, currently works at SUSE. And today we'll be talking about the Ceph project and its switch from installing regular software packages to deployment as application containers and the challenges um, face debugging when things go wrong. He assures us that today's talk isn't just for Ceph people, but about unexpected failures, of learning where to look when things break and trying to fix them. Tim will be happy to take questions at the end of the presentation if we have time, so stick around. A reminder to post questions in Benula's chat with the question um, tab, which is next to the, the chat tab. So we look forward to this. I'm looking forward to it. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, uh, or for the first time remotely, but here we go. So working at SUSE on, uh, I've, I've actually spent about the last 15 years, I think now, um, variously working on high availability and distributed storage. And the last six of that has been in, on, or around the Ceph project. Distributed storage systems are complicated. Uh, it's important that they're reliable. Uh, and if something does happen to break, it's, it's extremely important that you're able to troubleshoot them. I'm, I'm going to say at the outset that I don't actually think we never should have invented containers. But I did have this moment several months ago, late one night while working on Ceph, when I really wished we weren't using them. And that's because I was coming to terms the hard way with switching from package software to containers. Everything had changed, my system was broken, and I didn't know how to figure out what was wrong. And that, that late night moment of deep frustration is why I'm giving this talk now. Little bit of background. I'm talking here about application containers as opposed to system containers. A system container, I know how to deal with reasonably easily because it's essentially a really lightweight virtual machine, or you can treat it as one with most of an operating system inside and you can more or less treat it like you would any other machine. An application container is a bit different. It's a specific application or daemon in container form rather than delivered as a software package. And this is extremely useful um, because it's a way of making sure that your application or daemon is run in a tightly controlled environment uh, with known dependencies and or, you know nothing weird in there and, and there's no other weird stuff going on. Unfortunately, I had previously had relatively little experience with uh, actually using these things when I found myself thrown in the deep end. My, uh, my experience here as I mentioned earlier, um, and also in the intro, is with Ceph. I'm not. I'm going to try not to talk too much about what Ceph actually is and does, because what it is and does isn't terribly interesting from the perspective of this talk. Um, but what is interesting, and what I am talking about, is how it's deployed. Uh, but in order for what I'm going to talk about to make sense, I do actually have to say something about what Ceph is um, and how it hangs together, uh, so that people not familiar with it will have some context for, to, for the rest of the talk. So Ceph is a free and open source scale out distributed storage system, which you run on a cluster of many nodes, arguably the more the better. So think you've got a bunch of racks uh, with a bunch of servers in them and they're all full of disks. And on each one of those servers or nodes, you've got a whole bunch of Ceph daemons running. There's one object storage daemon or OSD for each disk. So there's lots of them. There's a few other daemons. Uh, at, at least you've got some mons, um, which keep track of the state of the cluster and manager daemons, which help with cluster administration, maintenance and other bits and pieces. You might also have metadata servers, uh, RADOS gateways and some other bits and pieces, depending on what you're doing and what services you're trying to provide. Now, these daemons all talk to each other to keep the cluster running. They write log messages, or they used to write log messages, 
to var log ceph whatever the daemon name is uh, they keep some state under var lib ceph uh, conf configuration files live in etc ceph and this is sort of all approximately what you would expect from a, a daemon on a linux or a unix like system there's a bunch of command line tools uh, for querying cluster status and making changes. A few of the common ones are listed here. There's some other ones too. But... And all of these bits and pieces have all always been historically been made available as regular packages. And actually they still are now, but um, uh, so RPMs or DEBs uh, are installed on your system. A configuration file is created. Uh, the relevant systemd service, uh, services are enabled and started for each daemon on each host, and away you go. Actually deploying a working Ceph cluster is somewhat more involved than that because certain daemons have to be deployed in a particular order. You have to do the mons, then the managers, then the OSDs, and you have to configure your disks and whatnot. But that's the essential idea of what you end up with. Um, a bunch of package software, a bunch of daemons, a bunch of services running. One of the consequences of having a complicated system like this is that it's difficult to deploy. And over the years, a number of ways to deploy Ceph evolved. There was Ceph Deploy, uh, which is now unmaintained, um, which was always only really a toy and became cumbersome at scale. But at least it didn't require anything other than SSH access to the systems that you were deploying. And it was reasonably easy to understand, uh, at least if you knew Ceph. Um, there were also Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Salt based ways of doing uh, Ceph deployment and probably others that I have forgotten about. And all of these things more or less work across multiple Linux distros and somehow have had to deal with uh, variances in packaging from one distro to another. So a certain amount of deployment complexity was either pushed out onto the administrator slash user uh, or was at least embedded variously in those deployment frameworks, so inside your salt states or Ansible playbooks or, or what have you. Still, once you had a cluster up and running, if something went wrong, uh, there were what I would consider some obvious places to look. The, uh, the Ceph command line tools, for example, Ceph status to check the cluster status. And then if you had a misbehaving daemon on some machine, you'd go and SSH into that node and you'd look at the log files in var log Ceph for that particular daemon. Maybe you would interrogate the daemons directly. There's commands that you can run to ask them for their state or what operations are in flight and that sort of thing. You can also inject changes. You can tell a daemon, please start spitting out more debug information now. Thank you. Um, again, using the Ceph command line tools. Maybe you want to tweak some configuration in your etc. Ceph, ceph.conf and restart a daemon, whatever. Uh, and for some bits of Ceph, for example, any of the Python modules that run inside the Ceph manager daemon, there's a whole other story there, but um, you could even actually go and tweak that Python code on a live cluster by editing the code under user share Ceph manager and restarting the relevant daemon. Now, if this were, um, if I could actually see the audience, I'm expecting head shaking at this point. And I wanna make it clear that I don't actually recommend doing that in production because ad hoc changes to random systems are a terrible idea. But as a contributor to the Ceph project myself, it was convenient for me to be able to um, like live hack that code to test certain like really small changes against something resembling a real cluster. So to sort of summarize all of that, Ceph um, has traditionally been difficult to deploy for new users and potentially irritating to maintain over time when you want to deploy new nodes or disks or services or upgrade to a new version. Um, as with deployment, upgrading the various daemons has to happen in a certain order. You need to do the mons, then the managers, then the OSDs, then the gateways, then the... Um, and ideally that's done with some sort of orchestration. And if you're using a, if you're running a smaller cluster where you've got some of these services co-located on, on the same nodes, you can get into some difficulties when upgrading because if you if you're running mons and OSDs on the same node and you upgrade all the packages, 
everything's upgraded at the same time. You don't have that ability to do the staged MONs and OSDs. And um, potentially your cluster, or at least part of it, doesn't work for the duration of the upgrade. It turns out that containerizing all of the Ceph daemons solves a lot of these usability problems, uh, which, to cut a long story short, is what we did with the Ceph Octopus release in 2020. So now, instead of using um, uh, one of about half a dozen different deployment frameworks for packaged software, uh, you instead either deploy Ceph with Kubernetes, uh, Ceph on Kubernetes with the Rook operator, or you deploy it using a tool called Ceph ADM, which is part of the Ceph project itself now, which will bootstrap a one node cluster. And then you can use the other Ceph command line tools to deploy additional daemons and nodes. The Ceph ADM mode is um, kind of neat because it relies on, uh, it, it was meant to be an easy way in for people who, who still wanted to use Ceph deploy, right? Uh, as one um, thing. Um, it, you don't need anything other than SSH, Python 3, LVM, and either the Podman or Docker container runtimes. And in either one of those modes, um, whether you're using Kubernetes or Ceph ADM, we're using the same container images uh, for all of the Ceph daemons. Um, and so that helps us in, in what we, we ship and everything. Um, and behind the scenes in Ceph, there's an orchestrator API so that each of these two deployment modes can interact with Ceph itself to get stuff done. And so that, for example, the Ceph dashboard can provide information about running hosts and services and that sort of thing. Um, so far, so good. Ceph is now a lot easier to deploy than it was in the past, um, particularly for new users. And there's there's more information about that online. The blog post I have linked here, um, I think Sage wrote that after we'd uh, initially had done the first release of this. And if you, uh, you should also check out Michael Hackett's talk from the LCA 2021 sysadmin mini conf once the recording's available, because that, that was also an excellent introduction to Ceph ADM, if you actually you know, want to go and do this stuff yourself. That said, in the process of making Ceph easier to deploy by containerizing everything, what we've, what we've done is we've added an extra layer or two of indirection between the admin or user and the Ceph, the actual demons that are running. And that makes various aspects of troubleshooting when things fail, um, suddenly more tricky, or at least it did for me. I'm mostly going to talk about the, um, the Ceph ADM Podman Docker case for the rest of this talk, because that's where most of my experience is. I haven't done a lot with Rook yet, but, um, but the difficulties that I experience coming to terms with these extra layers, I think apply um, equally to that space as well. The first fun thing is that as uh, there's no Ceph packages installed by default and everything is in containers, you don't actually have the Ceph command line tools by default anymore. In the Ceph ADM case, all you've got is a Ceph ADM script. And in the Rook slash Kubernetes case, you don't even have that. But all is not lost because all of those tools can also be run containerized um, because they all exist inside the same container image that we're using for the daemons. There's just an extra command that you need to run to do that, to start up and enter a toolbox container. It's so easy. In the Ceph ADM case, you just type uh, Ceph ADM shell, and then you're in the con it pulls a container image, you're in the container, you can run Ceph status. In the um, Kubernetes or Rook case, you just run kube control dash n rook ceph dash exec it kube control dash n rook ceph get pod dash l app equals rook ceph tools dash o json path equals items zero metadata name bash, and then you can run ceph status. Awesome. Um, that works fine for uh, simple status commands. Once you get into command line tools that take files as input or output, though, spinning up the toolbox container can become problematic because you have to pass the files in and out somehow. And, and honestly, in my opinion, it's just not worth the trouble. Thankfully, the Ceph common package is still available. So you can just install that and you can keep using the command line tools directly. Um, so when I'd done that and I went and checked the status of my, my cluster that I was working on, my, it was in health worn state and two of my OSDs were down. 
Uh, and this is this is one of the exciting moments that I had last year, which prompted me to write this talk. And this happened while I was working on upgrades from Ceph Nautilus to Ceph Octopus, which meant taking an existing cluster where everything was deployed old style as regular packages and switching to running everything in containers. Now, the Ceph ADM tool has uh, this adopt function, which lets you migrate from package mode to container mode uh, in a rolling fashion so that your whole storage cluster never goes down uh, during the process. This is really neat. The problem that I was having is that some of my OSDs, which are the daemons that are actually responsible for actually storing your data on the disks, wouldn't start again after a reboot, and I had no idea why. I knew enough to ask the Ceph orchestrator what was going on. Um, this command, Ceph Orch LS, will give you a list of what services are running um, across the cluster or, or are configured to run across the cluster. And there's um, there's similar commands for the with similar output if you're doing the Kubernetes thing. Now, in this case, um, this is just my tiny toy test cluster that I was running on virtual machines with just a single manager, a few mons, and half a dozen OSDs. The thing I want to highlight here is that the um, those that, that OSD all available devices line, um, two out of six, and the one below it with two out of four, um, and, and image name is mix, um, that, that, that sort of looks all a bit weird to me. Um, so, so um, I have to dig down a little bit further, and the Ceph orchestrator has a Ceph watch ps command for getting a, a list of all of the individual uh, uh, containers that are running across the cluster in their state. It's um, effectively um, uh, a cluster-wide podman ps, if you like. So if we if we go through this, my my manager is on node node one. My my mons are on node one, two, and three, and OSDs 3 and 5, which are meant to be running on node 3, they seem to be in error state. So let's go and have a look at node 3. Uh, there's another command we can use, cephadm ls, gives us a list of all of the containers on that node and tells us a bit about them, even if they're broken. Um, so, you know, the, the mons here, it's enabled, it's, it's running. If I go down to um, OSD 5, um, sure, it's enabled, but it's in error state. And there's one helpful thing that I've found here, which is uh, the systemd unit parameter. And that tells us what systemd service to, to query to get some more status. Um, so I went and did that, system, D, uh, system control status thing, um, and okay, fine, it's it's failed, and um, well, this is this is helpful. It, it failed. I tried to restart it, um, and it failed, and it's yep, okay, cool. Um, so I happen to know that um, the Ceph daemons by default aren't logging to var log Ceph anymore. Um, you can turn that back on, but that's not the default anymore they're logging to the journal. So, aha, journal control dash u for that unit file. I should point out um, for people using Ceph, there is a Ceph ADM logs command, which, which sort of tries to wrap some of this stuff up. But the I'm really trying to convey the flavor of the experience that I went through here, and also to demonstrate that sort of the, the levels that we've got in, in this thing. Um, so it started the OSD and um, it's gone error checking path var run ceph fsid uh, no such file or directory. And at this point, I was all, wait, like what? Um, why doesn't the var run directory exist? That used to happen automatically. Um, when we were doing, when you install Ceph as packages, there's a, a var, whatever it is, temp files uh, file, which, which makes sure that var run Ceph exists and everything. And so I was surprised that this wasn't there. And 
I was also equally surprised that this problem wasn't affecting the other daemons on the other hosts. So the key thing to understand here is that the individual daemons themselves, um, even though they've been containerized, they're still doing their thing in, in the same way that they always used to, as far as they're concerned. They still see a, a, a var run Ceph and a var lib Ceph and everything. Uh, they don't know that they're running inside containers. But from our perspective outside, they're all started a bit differently than they used to be. They log a bit differently and their state and config is in slightly different places. With the packaged version of Ceph, we had a bunch of systemd unit files, which were installed in the normal place under user lib systemd system. Um, I've hit, this one is for the Mon service. Um, I've abbreviated this a fair bit for this slide, but the point is that there's one of these for each type of daemon. They're parameterized on the whatever comes after the at sign. And each one of them has an exec start line that invokes that particular binary, Ceph, Mon, Ceph, OSD, whatever. The, the ID um, of the service, so the Mon host name or the OSD ID. And then you go and look in Valog Ceph, where, uh, you know, Ceph, Mon for the, the log files. And um, if you want to start and stop services, system control, start, stop, status, um, you know, as, as you would expect. In the Ceph ADM world with Podman or Docker, there's no shipped systemd unit files. Instead, they're generated automatically when new daemons are deployed. So they land in etc. systemd system. Um, and they're named a bit differently. There's sort of one for the whole cluster when the, with the, the, the daemon um, type and ID is the parameter that comes at the end. Um, and rather than, because there's sort of one for all daemons, rather than directly uh, starting a daemon, the exec start line here actually calls a bash script, which is one level deeper, which in turn is responsible for invoking the specific podman or docker commands necessary to start an individual daemon. Um, and then so you, your system control commands are slightly different because it's cephfsid at mon.id or osd.id. So let's go and look at one of those uh, unit.run scripts. There's an awful lot going on in this wall of text. Um, the first few lines do a bit of setup to make sure that uh, we make sure that there's a var run ceph directory on the host for us to use. And also that um, uh, there's a couple of podman commands to make sure that this container isn't already running um, or, or somehow present so we have a clean start. And then the podman run line actually um, starts the, the container daemon. And there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here too. The entry point gets overridden by, for, per the daemon type. So this will be either Ceph Mon or Ceph OSD or Ceph Manager or, or whatever. Um, there's a bunch of flags uh, for Podman. There's some environment variables that get passed into the container when it's running. It sets up a bunch of bind mounts. So var run Ceph FSID um, on the host, which is that directory that was created up at the top, is mapped internally to var run Ceph inside the container and the same with um, var log and etc. and all of those things. Um, and then uh, eventually at the end, we're specifying the image to use, which in my case happens to be on my local registry. It's not an upstream image. And then there's a bunch more parameters which are actually passed into Ceph Mon itself. The problem I had earlier with the OSDs not starting was because of a bug in the generated OSDs unit run script, where it first invokes podman run with and tries to, to bind mount this um, uh, the var run ceph directory inside so it can run some disk activation. But it was doing that before um, actually creating that directory, um, which is never going to work. This particular issue only turned up, though, when doing upgrade testing. It hadn't showed up anywhere else because by happy miracle, in every other case, some other Ceph daemon had already created that var run directory before the OSD started. Anyway, um, I fixed that particular bug back in September. But the point is, like I said earlier, there's there's an extra couple of layers of indirection between the user or admin and the daemons that are running. And now um, this, this isn't an issue that, that 
I hope anybody actually hit in production because we found it in development and testing and everything. But um, when things break in particularly weird ways like this, and something will always inevitably break eventually in a particularly weird way, you have to know what all of those layers are and potentially strip them all away to find out what's going on. Um, even to the point of running those individual podman commands from that run script uh, uh, from a shell to see how they behave and what they expect. Then there's the fun you can have with containers when they're running. The, the Ceph ADM tool has a handy way to let you get a shell inside a running container. This is different than Ceph ADM shell, which spins up a new container. This is Ceph ADM enter um, actually drops you inside a running container. Um, this is, of course, just a convenience wrapper around uh, podman exec it container sh. But this is there so that you can uh, interact directly with running Ceph daemons um, using tools that are present in the container, but probably aren't present on the host. And this is helpful because you can ask individual daemons what they're doing. Um, as I, I mentioned earlier, you can tell a daemon to jack up its debug levels if you want to get more information out of it. And being able to do that from inside the running container um, to talk to the daemon's admin socket, you have you, that's sort of where you have to do it from, effectively. There's, yeah. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I sometimes, in the pre-container world, found it useful to go and edit Python code in use a share Ceph manager on a running cluster when I wanted to test little minor fixes for certain issues. And suddenly I couldn't do that anymore with containerized services. But wait, what if I use podman exec IT bash to get a shell inside the container? Then I can go and edit files to my heart's content, except there's no editor in there, which is probably for the best. As luck would have it, however, the SUSE based container image I was using did have the zipper package manager installed. So I was able to go and add a, add a software repository and install Vim and then start, you know, messing around. I want to make it very clear that nobody should ever actually do this. It's an extremely bad idea. Your changes won't persist. Uh, and it violates one of the key reasons for using containers in the first place, um, which is you've got all of these neat little containers running, which you can create and destroy at will, um, but which you otherwise don't mess with. I I'm sure somebody will do this out in the wild because you, you, you can and, and they'll get confused. But this is why I'm saying don't do it. Um, but uh, I, was, I was irritated personally because I wanted to test this little two line change to some Python code. And the, the right way to do that against an actual running cluster would be for me to build a new Ceph package with the changes applied, which takes like an hour, and then build a new container image, which included that Ceph package, and then deploy that container image on my running cluster. The, the right way would have taken me a couple of hours. Um, the wrong way took me five minutes. If your uh, side note, if you're working out of a Ceph source tree, there is a C patch tool, which will go and actually try to patch containers with changes from your um, uh, uh, source tree, but so that's that's another right way of doing it. But anyway, I just wanted to make this little change and test it. Um, the the last thing that I want to talk about, um, perhaps slightly more briefly, but we'll see how we go, is container orchestration. So you've got uh, you've got a whole bunch of containerized services. Uh, running and they all need to talk to each other to do something useful and you might want to spin up a new service or add new nodes or, or scale things somehow and and being able to orchestrate all of this means that you don't have to think about it and that's really really good it's awesome um, I, I can just say to either kubernetes uh, rook or ceph adm i want three mon daemons three managers i want the osds to eat all the disks and later, maybe I want to say, oh, hey, it'd be really neat if you could spin up a few RADOS gateways, go for it. And that's fine. Uh, that's fine as long as everything works. When it doesn't work, you're left digging through the logs of the orchestrator or trying to cajole it into deploying what you want. Um, and it's totally possible to do this. Don't get me wrong. Um, but um, you can end up in strange um, states and have difficulty figuring out why. 
it's it's entirely possible to end up in a situation where the orchestration framework will keep attempting to deploy something which, for whatever reason, keeps failing to start. Um, maybe that's due to incorrect configuration or to some fundamental underlying bug or, or worse, both. But the point is you want this thing to go, it's not working, and you're left trying to figure out why. You can figure it out. Um, there's, uh, 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 there's tools for getting logs out. There's the, the Ceph Orch um, LS that I mentioned earlier. If you give it the right um, flag to make it spit out some YAML, it will give you a nice dump of all of the configuration that the orchestrator is actually trying to apply. So you can, you can see what it's trying to do. And there's... Um, uh, 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 Ceph logs last, Ceph ADM, whatever the command is, just to see the last set of logs that have come out of certain places. So you can discover it, but um, you can also end up in a position where you're having to sort of track things through layer by layer, and it, it, I, it can still be a pain, especially if you if it, you know if you, you're new to it, right? One extremely trivial example of this problem is that it's possible to end up running mixed versions of container images within a cluster. There was an edge case that I came across at one point where I was using a um, uh, I was using a local mirror uh, of, of uh, a local registry for container images because I was spinning up I was deploying and destroying um, uh, services a lot and I didn't want to have to pull these images from um, the other side of the world uh, every time I did that um, so I'm running my own local registry and there was a configuration option that. Um, wasn't set correctly. And I ended up actually having deployed um, uh, half-ish the, the daemons running on my cluster with the images that I expected to be using. And the other half got pulled down from um, upstream while I wasn't looking. Um, similar, and that, that my fault, um, you know, missing configuration option. But um, Still, similarly, if you deploy using the container image that's tagged latest, um, when you initially deploy your, your cluster, you'll be using whatever version latest was at that time. And if you expand your cluster later, later, latest, Jesus, um, and that image has had a version bump in the meantime, you'll end up deploying new services with a version that's newer than the um, existing services running in your cluster and that is unlikely to end well um, i came across a timely tweet while i was working through this talk again at the last minute um, where darren shepherd says kubernetes orchestration has been compared to jazz improv in practice it's much more like a seventh grade band concert where you're happy in the end because your kid didn't drop their instrument I'm not going to pretend to speak for Darren here. Uh, we do share an employer now, but we haven't actually met or discussed this stuff. That, that tweet really resonated with me though, because I read it as someone wanting a thing to work really well that should work really well and having it not quite go so well, but sort of still being happy we're getting somewhere, but, um, and, and expressing that with a, you know, a little bit of humor or, or and I think taking the piss out of systems like this um, a little bit is, you know, it, it can be, um, it's, it's helpful. It's, it's bad if you take it too far because you never want to end up in a, in a situation where you're kicking somebody's puppy and that's, that's not helpful. And I really hope I haven't done that with how I named this talk because my talk title is possibly a little bit harsher than Darren's tweet, but, um, I think it's important to recognize those times where people have these moments of frustration with technology because those cries of pain um, can help us, they can help to tell us what we need to fix. Um, I, I wrote this talk because the things that I personally actually needed to do, uh, troubleshooting weird failures, uh, variously hacking on or testing bits of code in, in strange environments, and, and understanding what the orchestrator was doing had suddenly become way more complicated than they used to be, at least from my perspective, and I got cranky. I think in some respects, if I had no prior experience deploying Ceph the old way uh, as package software, I may have dealt better with the containerized forms because I wouldn't have had any preconceptions about where things should have been or how they should have worked. On the other hand, I also wouldn't have known as much about the internals of Ceph 
Um, so I may not have had as good an idea where to look when certain things failed. Um, it's difficult for me to be objective about this because I'm, I'm too close to the whole thing. The most useful takeaway here, in my opinion, is that this experience demonstrates that there's a certain, there's a, a, a tension between usability and complexity in, in different areas of software and for different use cases. Containerizing Ceph made it easier to deploy for new users and easier to manage and maintain. At the same time, though, it resulted in additional implementation complexity, which makes troubleshooting certain types of failure more cumbersome than it used to be. I don't think you can ever get away from making trade-offs of that nature, though. Everything we do with software, uh, in my opinion, is or should be to somehow make life better for someone. Um, the, the general question there is, whose life are we making better, how and why? Um, that's stated like that, that's an incredibly broad question, uh, broad question and it's um, uh, far bigger than this talk, um, and it's one I'm not actually qualified to answer because that would require input from somebody with some, some sort of background in the humanities. So I'm going to make a smaller statement, which I am more or less qualified to make, and that is that you can't fundamentally, you can't make fundamentally complicated systems any less complicated by containerizing everything. The best you can do is move the complexity from one place to another and hope and hopefully you will eventually end up in a position where the complexity has been moved away from the users, away from the troubleshooters, and onto the creators of the systems and into knowledge embedded in the tools themselves and into better documentation and user experience so that nobody else ever has that moment I had that caused me to write this talk. Um, I think we still have some work to do on this front, but I also think we can do it. Thank you very much. I hope you've uh, enjoyed that little rant. Rant? Rant? Rant. That was Me, great. Which Thank good. you. <laughs> it's the end of the day. <laughs> Thanks yeah. very much, Tim. Um, uh, at some point, you talked about the, the flavor of your presentation, and I think it really shone through. I could really feel sort of the frustration and the passion that you have for your work through this presentation, which was great to see. Um, we you. do have some questions coming through. Um, this one's yep. from um, a little bit earlier in the talk. Um, shouldn't Kubernetes have replaced the failed nodes or not possible with Ceph? Um, it depends. Um, classic, classic distributed storage answer. Um, so um, in a Ceph cluster, some things are stateful and some are stateless. Um, if you have uh, the, the mons and the managers, the metadata servers, um, if one of them dies, you can spin up another one somewhere else and it all just sort of works because it doesn't really matter where they're running. Um, for OSDs, the, um, uh, uh, which are actually backed by a physical disk, um, you, you can't sort of magically make another one of them come up somewhere else without somebody running out and moving a disk around. Okay. Okay, so up next, we have a question. If, thing, if things need to run in a particular order depend or dependencies, should that be Kubernetes orchestration dash helm, not scripts that run in that container? Um, yes, um, if you're doing it with um, uh, Kubernetes and helm, you, yes. Um, and even in the not, um, possibly I didn't cover it clearly enough, even in the non Kubernetes uh, case, um, in the, the Ceph ADM case, when you're doing upgrades, we actually, there is some knowledge about that inside um, Ceph itself about what order to do things in. Okay. Hope that answers that. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up, is a zipper necessary in the container at all? I sincerely doubt it. I, I suspect actually in that case that this, um, this container was built on top of a, I'd have to check, but um, this was built on top of a default minimal um, uh, a SLES template based thing, which actually had that in there. So it, ideally, it, it, um, you don't want people doing crazy things like I do. <laughs> that was interesting, the big yes, do not attempt this. <laughs> you, you'll okay. just get into trouble. <laughs> yeah, it's good to know that going into it though. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, next question. Are there plans for a test suite CI pipeline um, for Ceph ADM that would potentially catch this issue? This issue. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, anything. Um, so I should be able to answer that, and I can't. Um, there's. Um, there's, I, I'm, I'm not sure how complete that is at the moment. Um, I know that earlier on in the, the Ceph ADM development, there had been areas that were particularly patchy um, with regards uh, testing. And um, we've, uh, you know, everybody wants to improve that. I just can't say off the top of my head exactly what state it's in right now. Is that something that comes up a bit? Uh, yeah, we. I, I was... Um, chatting about it with a couple of colleagues a couple of weeks ago, actually. It's just, I actually haven't looked at, at what's, what's being run automatically myself in the, in the last, you know, little while. So. Okay. So we we do want to make sure that we're actually doing automated testing of everything because that would have caught some of these things and, um, you know, yeah. In a perfect world, huh? <laughs> Yep. Okay, next question. What's your take on putting all this stuff into an operator, like an OCS, uh, in other words, more turtles? Um, I don't know how to answer that question. Maybe grab me later on the chat and we can go into more detail. That sounds good. Okay, what have we got up next? Okay, here we go. Uh, would more faster would more or faster storage hardware for testing and build clusters be an option to shorten the system level build pipeline elapsed time? Um, maybe. Um, um, if you're talking about actually compiling Ceph itself, that that just takes ages because it's you know um, large. Um, um, so I'm going to say, yeah, sure. Um, you know, you can always add more hardware to make things things um, faster. Yep. And can you see any sort of big changes in this area coming up, or where do you sort um, of see this? You know, any any great changes? Well, I, I think overall um, this. Doing this whole container thing, either uh, Kubernetes or um, or Ceph ADM, has is actually is good for for Ceph. So it's sort of a, it's a step in the right direction in terms of usability and everything. Um, there's um, there's there's work going on to make the things that I've complained about easier to deal with, um, to improve um, the tooling so that you can get more status out of out of what the the orchestrator is doing and um, and um, there's other, without going into huge amounts of detail about the bits inside Ceph itself, there's other work going on to, um, uh, for example, the, the, there's a Ceph dashboard GUI which um, knows how to do some things but doesn't know how to do everything yet. So there's some work going on to improve that and hook things together and make things easier. Do you have any advice for people who want to sort of explore this further, perhaps, you know, increase their skill and knowledge level in this area? Um, about, do you mean uh, Ceph specifically or containers in general? Yeah. yeah. All of the above. All of the above. Um, so um, Ceph specifically, Ceph.io, the, the blog there has some, um, you know, up-to-date stuff about um, what uh, what interesting things are happening. There's IRC channels and mailing lists for those. Mm -hmm. um, the um, The... Uh, uh, likewise, for, for Rook, there's the um, GitHub projects there and, and the relevant mailing lists and things mm -hmm. there as well. Um, would be a good place to, to look for those things in general. Yeah, that's great. That's great advice. Thank you. Okay, so I think we'll probably leave it there. Thank you so much for ending the day for us. It was a really great presentation. Um, Thank you. Lots to take away from that. I think for everybody, will I think there'll probably be quite a lot of discussion afterwards as people unpack all of that information. Uh, so just a reminder to everybody that Tim will be available on the post Q and A channel um, to keep the discussion going. So feel free to ask questions or delve a little bit deeper in that space. 
Um, so that's a wrap. Uh, thank you everyone for taking part in LCA 2021. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being in Rusty Owl Hall today. And we would love to hit, love you to head over to the main stage at Tux Theatre for the conference closing. So that's in about 15 minutes uh, at 5.40. So that'd be great to see everybody there for closing of, this, of the conference. And thanks again, Tim, for being with us. Thank you for having me. Cheers.